So it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker this evening, Ross Horsley. Ross coordinated the oral history project, West Yorkshire Queer Stories, and he now works as the volunteer manager for the Thackeray Medical Museum here in Leeds. Today, he's going to talk to us about the risk we take LGBTQ histories of Leeds. So welcome, Ross, and over to you. Thank you very much, Alan, for that introduction. And thank you very much for having me tonight. So yes, as you say, my name is Ross Horsley and I currently work at the Thackeray Museum. But for the last few years until I took on this role, I was co-managing a rather large oral history project that um, interviewed LGBTQ people across West Yorkshire. So tonight in this talk, I'm going to be looking at events and stories that took place around Leeds from roughly the 1960s to the 1990s. And as I say, these are drawn from the oral history collection that we built up as part of West Yorkshire Queer Stories. And we did this between 2018 and 2020. I'm just gonna share my screen with you now because I realize I haven't done that. So just bear with me a moment. So West Yorkshire Queer Stories itself was funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and managed by the sexual health organization based in Leeds, which is Yorkshire Mesmac. Um, our aim was to collect stories and objects from LGBT people across West Yorkshire, which we would donate to archives and museums and make available online. Tonight, I'm gonna to focus on Leeds and, and I've picked the 1960s onwards. That's largely to reflect the collection itself, uh, which is based on living memory. Um, much of these sorts of histories aren't otherwise recorded, at least not publicly. Um, so going back to the 1960s um, is, is, you know, a fairly good start um, oral history wise. The 60s, as I'm sure you're aware, was also a period of great change and influence um, in the UK and worldwide. Uh, so in 1967, we had the Sexual Offences Act in the UK, which uh, partially decriminalised homosexuality in this country. And then over in New York City in 1969, we had the Stonewall Riots, and both of these were catalysts for the sorts of change that I'm talking about. And just before we start, you'll see that I've highlighted there the acronym that I'm using tonight, which is LGBTQ. Uh, this stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer or questioning. So there are many and various versions of this acronym, and they're used by people to try and be as inclusive and representative as possible. I've gone with LGBTQ tonight because I use the word queer as an umbrella term for anything that isn't represented by the L, G, B and T there. So I consider queer a reclaimed and quite celebratory term really. It's not one that I use to try and cause any offence. Um, I believe that everyone has the right to describe and represent their sexuality and their gender in whatever way feels true and right to them and that we should all try and respect that. So I do apologize in advance if I say anything that suggests otherwise, it's just me not explaining myself very well, which does happen sometimes. So I wanted to just quickly tell you a little bit about West Yorkshire Queer Stories itself. As I say, it ran from 2000 to 2020, and we collected 200 individual recordings, which were called stories with different people, and over 50, um, documents and photographic collections which we donated to different archives and they included the West Yorkshire Archive Service who inherited all the audio, uh, Leeds Museums and Galleries who took our objects off us and added them into their collections to help diversify the huge and very varied already collection that they have and then some other things like uh, a large uh, collection of posters and leaflets went to the Thackeray Museum and some 20 books and pamphlets also went to Leeds Libraries. Um, I think it's worth sort of thinking about oral histories themselves and do we trust them? Uh, so some but not all of the things that I'll talk about tonight are drawn from spoken testimonies. Others come from newspaper reports, which also can be one person's account of things. Um, but I think it's worth going into these stories with a questioning but an open mind. We owe it to the people who came forward with their stories to let them challenge our preconceptions and we should value the risks that they take in telling them. And that phrase is actually the jumping off point for this talk. So it comes from the words of J.B. Wilmot, who was the conference secretary for a conference that took place in Leeds in 1974. And this was the country's first national conference on transgender issues. 
and the conference itself was called Transvestism and Transsexualism in Modern Society. Obviously, those are some words that we don't tend to use these days. They've fallen out of favor a little bit. We'd probably use the word transgender or trans now. The reason that you can see the Guildford Hotel on your screen is that the night before the conference, so that was on the 15th of March, this hotel hosted a reception and a coffee evening for delegates just ahead of the conference. This was also attended by a reporter from the Yorkshire Post who was called Geoffrey Winter. And he quoted the secretary as saying, this is a breakthrough. It's the first time that a conference like this has been attempted, certainly in England, and I want it to be a success. This is a serious conference, but one thing we want to show people that we have two heads, that we can act sensibly and respectably as women without causing offence to anybody. The reporter went on to ask if the delegates had traveled to the conference in his, in his words, dressed as women. And the reply was, this is the risk we take. We're hoping that in this day and age, people will be a bit more tolerant. So was the conference itself a success? Well, via West Yorkshire Queer Stories, we never actually managed to interview anybody who attended, but we did get hold of the conference report, which was published by the Beaumont Society. Now they were the, the society that organized the conference and booked all the venues. Um, and a full copy of this conference report is now held at the West Yorkshire Archives. But yes, the conference itself was well attended. And the report includes newspaper coverage from the Yorkshire Post and the Bradford Telegraph and Argus. And these, you know, they, they're not bad articles. They kind of do include the kind of jokes that you might associate with a programme like, are you being served or something like that. But they also include plenty of quotes from the organisers and the attendees of the conference. And if anything, both of these reports do land on the side of acceptance and tolerance. Here's a little bit from the report. This is a, a reprint of the conference program from 1974. And you can see on it some of the venues that were used by the conference. So most of these are around the university. So you see things like the Polytechnic Common Room, the Lipman Building. And you'll also see it's a mixture of talks and um, less formal things like social events, including a disco. If you want to read the full story um, from either of those newspapers, uh, you can do that on the West Yorkshire Queer Stories website, as long, um, also along with this, this full conference guide as well. It looks like uh, this conference went ahead without a hitch, um, but that's not the same um, of all events that were taking place around that time. We heard stories from the same era illustrating much less in the way of tolerance of LGBTQ people. And this includes one that took place at the Great Northern Hotel in 1973. So this big building here, um, which is pictured in a postcard image from a, a fair bit earlier to this particular story, um, was uh, it housed a bar called the Buccaneer Bar. This was a favourite meeting place of the Leeds branch of the GLF, or the Gay Liberation Front. This was a national society that was inspired by an American movement of the same name, which began just after the Stonewall riots in 1969 in New York City. The UK offshoots that existed um, tended to start up in the early 1970s and their aim was to promote equality, organise fundraising and also organise social events for gay people. Uh, the Leeds GLF met at the University Student Union on Friday nights and they typically follow up their meeting by heading down to the Fenton pub on Woodhouse Lane, which is also close to where they had campaign headquarters and an LGBT bookshop, which opened in 1973. But they also met at the Buccaneer Bar, which was described by one member of the group that we interviewed called Patrick, one of the main gay pubs in Leeds at the time, albeit unofficially, uh, because it doesn't sound from his story like the Great Northern Hotel management were very sympathetic. It all began with an altercation on a Saturday evening, which involved the hotel manager. And he told the group that the bar was closing for refurbishment. So the group moved on to another bar in the building, which was called the Ork Bar. But again, the manager came and asked them to leave. And he was followed by his wife, who told them that meeting there would put other customers off and damage the business. In Patrick's words, that cut no ice with us. We didn't leave. So in the end, the manager called the police and the police said we had to leave. It wasn't our property. One or two of us walked out. Some of us decided we were going to stay. And some of us were frog marched out. I was one of those. Two police officers got hold of my arms, frog marched me out of the pub, 
At least one of our number laid down on the floor and decided he wasn't going to move. So, of course, he was dragged out. Anyway, we were all dragged, carried or walked out in the end. There weren't any arrests or anything. And that was the end of that episode. The group never actually returned to the Buccaneer Bar, but the Leeds branch of the GLF continued to be active until around 1974, when it merged with the University Student Run Gay Society. You can actually see, if you look at this photograph, you can see some JLF members. They're the ones with the banner towards the back, the large white banner towards the back of the photograph. Uh, this is a photo from February of 1972, and it's a protest march held in solidarity with the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, this was following the Bloody Sunday killings, which had taken place just a few weeks earlier in January. Now, it may be that the hostility shown towards the GLF by the Great Northern Hotel at the time stemmed from negative press coverage of another gay bar in Leeds, uh, which took place both locally and nationally. And that's the Hope Anchor, now known as the New Penny, on Call Lane. Um, this pub has its own Civic Trust blue plaque, which calls it one of the longest continually running LGB and T venues in the UK. It's also sometimes referred to as the first gay venue to open outside of London, but that'd be a difficult one to prove. But either way, it opened in 1953. Of course, it didn't open as a gay venue. And in 1968, when it was featured in these two newspaper articles that I was mentioning, it was owned and managed by a married couple called John and Kathy Wilson. John was a former professional rugby player from New Zealand and his wife, Kathy, worked behind the bar. And she saw herself as a friend and mother figure to the clientele. Both of them described the lesbian and gay crowd as making up 90% of the pub's custom and being good for business and causing no trouble. The first news article was this one by student journalist John Dalton. And this was published in the Leeds University Union News on the 8th of March, 1968. It's not a hugely disparaging piece, but it does wallow in what it seems to think of as sleazy details. So there's talk of male customers wearing blouses and having dyed blonde hair and wanting to watch so-called kinky films like Valley of the Dolls, which if you've seen it, it probably wouldn't be called very kinky by today's standards. Almost without realizing it, the article also touches on some of the horrors that the patrons have been through, like extreme bullying at work and gay aversion therapy. And if you're not familiar with gay aversion therapy, it's something that we also collected at least one fairly detailed story about via West Yorkshire Queer Stories. Very basically, um, it's uh, kind of based on the idea um, of being a medical treatment, which it isn't really, but it involves uh, subjecting the patient to uh, miles or sometimes not so mild electric shocks via electrodes on their wrists. And this will be done in conjunction with showing the photographs of male and female models. The idea being that if you're a gay man, every time the attractive male model pops up, you get an electric shock and it's supposed to cure you of your medical condition. Um, but of course it doesn't work, or at least nobody that's ever gone through it um, that I've heard of says it works. And if you want to know more about it, you can listen to a story about that on the website, um, West Church Queer Stories, and um, either search a version therapy or search for Bill. He's the person who shared the story with us. But anyway, Following the article here from the 8th of March, um, letter on the 24th, what happened next was that the People, the national paper, got hold of the story and published this piece. The reporter, who was called Dennis Cassidy, visited the Hope and Anchor with a bit more of an agenda this time, and it's made clear in the opening paragraphs of this piece, which I'll just read out to you. So the piece begins. Last year, Parliament passed a law legalising homosexual acts between consenting adults and private. Note the key words in private. Acts must not be in a public place and must not involve more than two people. The new law makes it quite clear that acts offending public decency will not be tolerated. It allows stiff prison sentences for people who do not comply with it. But last week, I witnessed conduct which I consider went way beyond the bounds of decency. It was in a crowded pub. Not in simple old Soho, mind you, or permissive Paddington. This pub is in the centre of the homely, respectable Yorkshire town of Leeds. Now, the indecent behaviour that um, goes on to describe includes men dancing cheek to cheek, kissing passionately and holding hands, petting and embracing. He also talks about lesbian weddings, customers who pull their pants down on the dance floor. 
It uh, kind of gloats over kind of non-traditional clothing and hairstyles and sorts of things mentioned in the previous article. But above all, the tone of this one is disgust, really, at the idea that gay men and lesbians might be enjoying themselves in a pub. It, interestingly, it also does on the upsetting events in most of the patrons' life, which range from sexual abuse to public humiliation, but there's no hint of empathy or understanding um, in the way it reflects these stories. Here's a picture from the article. This is Kathy Wilson, the, one of the licensees, and also one of the bar staff as well, called Donald. Uh, Donald's quoted in the article as saying, I don't want to change, I'm happy as I am. I don't want to see any doctors. The landlady does my hair and I've got friends. And the article itself concludes, it's about time the authorities took some notice of the hope and anchor. It's about time, in fact, that the police put an end to the odd goings on in there. Well, actually, it wasn't the police who put an end to nights out at the Hope and Anchor two weeks later. It was football hooligans who targeted and wrecked the pub in April of 1968, to the extent that it had to close for a while, and it saw a change of management before reopening. Somebody else who took notice of Example, was one of the people that we interviewed for Westchurch Queer Stories, and she's called Linda. Uh, she's from Keithley, and she's from her mid-70s. And she remembers, I used to sort of be really, really concerned that if anybody knew I was lesbian, then everything would be terrible and my life would be awful, and I didn't know anybody else who was lesbian. So I never asked anything about being lesbian until I read an article in the News of the World. Obviously, she's talking about the people here. The article highlighted the new penny pub in Leeds, which used to be called the Hope and Anchor. And it was showing people and the faces were kind of covered up. And I thought, oh, crikey, there's other people like me. But I wouldn't have gone to the pub. I wouldn't have come through to Leeds to go to the pub or anything. There's a little picture of the blue flag on the new penny. Um, another gay person who's too scared to go to the pub because of rumours he'd heard was Raymond. And he recalls, some people said, you don't really want to go in there because you get a lot of people coming in to have a look. The men in there have white see-through trousers on and there's money stuck to the floor and it's stuck there so you have to bend down and then you're supposed to get groped. So that put me off going there for a very long time. And when I came across gay people eventually, they were just like ordinary people. But on telly, they were people that you didn't really want to be associated with. You laughed at them, but you definitely didn't want to be associated with them. So even when young LGBTQ people did pluck up the courage to go somewhere like the Hope and Anchor. The experience wasn't always a good one. Another interviewee of ours, Robert, went there in the early 70s and he called it the most unpleasant experience I've ever had. And he referred to filthy toilets and what he called us uh, sordid looking people. But I suppose when you think about it, the kinds of rumors and press stories that people like Robert would be exposed to would make them scared to even be seen anywhere near a place like that. So it's unlikely to prepare them for a great night out. I don't mean to dwell disproportionately on pubs. There's a lot more to kind of queer history than that. But I do know from working in local history, a lot of people are interested in pubs and their history. And they are part of the city's past. So I did just want to briefly share a couple of other interesting stories. So this is the Mitre Hotel. And this reflects a story that we collected as part of West Yorkshire Queer Stories that goes back to 1958, making it one of the earliest that we recorded. Um, it's pictured here in 1900, but it probably wouldn't have looked hugely different by 1950s. And the reason this was probably quite popular um, with gay men in the evenings is because it had a below street level location. Um, it was quite discreet in the sense that it had large ornate booths, it had pillars. And according to customers' memories, uh, the police also had a surprisingly sympathetic attitude towards it as well. Barry himself recalls, in 1958, I was a skinny young 17 year old who had never been to a gay bar. One evening, I plucked up all my courage to go to the Mitre pub. I walked down the steps into a dimly lit tavern and ordered my half a pint of beer so that I could get out quickly without wasting money. That half pint cost eight old pence, which would be about four pence now. And of course, I'd gone too early. There was maybe a couple of other guys sitting on stools talking to the barman. One of them had a dog sitting at his feet. I was sort of half hidden behind a pillar so as not to be seen, but I did it and I thought, well, this isn't much fun, and I didn't go back for years. Barry also remembers that many of the men who socialised in places like the Mitre 
at the time wore suede shoes and or a cravat. And this was an era when most men would have been wearing suits and ties and shirts. So both of these sort of mild fashion statements were coded signals for being gay. This is the Dot Green Inn in Hare Hills. In the 1980s, women only discos organized by local lesbians were held here. And at their peak, they took place every other Wednesday from 8.30 until 11 p.m., alternating with similar nights at the Woodpecker Inn in Bermontops. Amateur DJs would bring their own records, often traveling by bike, and play these on the sound system of the pub in a hired room on the first floor. The women would use a side entrance, which I think you can see in this photo. There's definitely side entrances. Um, and one of these led straight upstairs to the first floor. And upstairs uh, on the first floor, the staff would all be female uh, on these nights. And despite this segregation from the main bar, the events didn't really see any trouble. Um, neither were they attended exclusively by lesbians. They're also popular with feminist groups and members of organizations like the Miners' Wives, who had been publicly supported by lesbians. Adverts uh, for women-only discos, which I found in the Leeds other paper. And these both go back to 1989, but I did sort of discover when I was looking through um, that there were many examples of these. They weren't difficult to find at all, and they ran almost throughout the 1980s. So you can see another couple of popular venues there for women's discos. Um, they, they included the Astoria on Round Hay Road and the one that you can see in the advert for Garbo's on the right here, um, the West Indian Centre in Chapel Town. Uh, you'll notice that the venue for the Christmas disco organised by Lesbian Line isn't actually printed. And this obviously is fairly common practice at the time, especially for LGBTQ group things. But what you'd do is you'd phone a number to find out the location. And it was hoped that this would minimise the risk of troublemakers attending the event or people um, finding out about it and causing some upset or homophobic abuse to the patrons. It's also possible that some venues only allowed the events to go ahead as long as the venue name wasn't publicised in this kind of context. According to one of our interviewees, Joe, the lesbians who attended the discos outside of the city centre tended to be a younger crowd and they wear an unofficial uniform of dungarees and Doc Martens. Occasionally, there'd be women who they referred to as straight dykes, who came up from town and were, in Joe's words, older and wearing dresses and coats with nice hair that might be curled or permed. And, but they got along just fine with each other. They'd swap stories, they'd um, find out about the gay-friendly bars in town. And Joe remembers, I had curly hair then, which I quite liked. I never had a crop or a crew cut, Lots of women liked a Sinead O'Connor haircut, but I never did that. But I did have a pair of dungarees for at least two or three years. I had an obligatory pair of Doc Martin boots from the Army and Navy store. I did get some abuse on the street. I got stones thrown at me at least once or twice. I remember some guy just slapped me in the face when we passed each other. I mean, I didn't know him. I think that was homophobia, really, an anti-gay vibe. Things are better than that now. I haven't been slapped in the face for ages. Again, I think we're coming back to that phrase, the risks we take. For some members of the LGBT community, it's a risk just to identify with certain groups or express themselves in a way that defies expectations. And faced with that risk, some people make the choice to make their clothing overtly political. So here's a group of lesbians from Leeds who've traveled down to London to take part in a lesbian strength march that took place on the 23rd of June, 1984. According to the oral histories that we collected, demonstrating, travelling together like this, was a big part of local lesbian life. So as well as marches like this, uh, many Leeds lesbians also travelled down to the Green and Common Women's Peace Camp during the weekends throughout the 1980s. And some uh, actually sought um, arrest in order to draw greater attention to their cause. One woman we interviewed even planned her holidays from work to coincide with the time she expected to spend in prison. And if you want to hear that story, that's also available on the Westchurch Queer Stories website. Uh, search for Lynn and you'll be able to hear that story. But one of the reasons that I wanted to show this particular photo, other than the fact it's fantastic, is that we managed to collect as part of West Yorkshire Queer Stories, not only stories around it and the women's organisation leads lesbian life, but also some of these clothes themselves. So if you take a little look at the picture, uh, the woman on the right of who's holding the banner 
has a, a white t-shirt on that says lesbian strength. And we managed to collect that as part of the project. And it's now part of Leeds Museums and Galleries collection. Here it is on display actually in LGBT History Month of 2020, um, along with some jumpers, um, which were knitted by one of the founders of Leeds Lesbian Line called Leslie Pattinson. She started the organization along with some friends in 1982. And you can actually see two jumpers in this picture. So there's the one in the bottom right, which is sort of rainbow pattern and has uh, little women's symbols across it. And then also in the top left, you can just see the bottom of one that I'll show you a bit better in a moment. And that is black with a red pattern on it. And in the picture, you can also see the knitting patterns for both of these jumpers. And um, these were made available and sold for 10 pence so that money would be raised for Leeds Lesbian Line. And the other jumper went on display last year for Leeds Museum's 200th birthday exhibition. And you can see that one here again with the knitting patterns. Uh, Leslie remembers wearing this jumper to dance in when it wasn't too hot at the Dot Green pub that we saw a couple of slides ago. Uh, she saw it as a way to identify as a lesbian without coming out really obviously to everyone around her, just those who were more clued into the symbolism that you can see on the jumper. So if you take a little bit of a closer look at that jumper, you'll see it's a bolt of red lightning, which she sees as symbolizing power and energy and even fear, the idea that people might be and should be scared of the more sort of active lesbians. And it's against the backdrop of three interlocked women's uh, symbols, which Leslie saw as representing unity and shared strength between lesbians. She originally came across this image on a postcard which advertised the National Lesbian Conference of 1981. Now, the lesbian line that Leslie was involved in opened in 1982, but I did recently come across an earlier service called the Leeds Nightline for Gay Women. And that was um, featured in the Leeds other paper in 1977. They have a bit of an interview with Jane, who is one of the founders of this particular version of the Leeds lesbian line. Um, and she talks about this one as being owned and operated from a private house, um, which causes a few problems with staffing um, in that they obviously they've advertised certain times that the line is available, but there's not always somebody in at those times. And it's problems like this that eventually led to the closure of this particular line. Um, during my stretch of stories, I didn't come across anybody who uh, particularly mentioned this version or, or this early version of the Leeds Lesbian line. Um, so I think a bit more research is possibly needed on that one. Um, it's the sort of thing that's fairly frequently mentioned in the Leeds other paper. So I might have a look through that to see if we can find out what's going on with it between this era, the late 70s, and 1982, when Leslie's involved in setting up uh, a more long-running version of Leeds Lesbian Line. That just being advertised um, in this edition of Bradford Gay, which is a newsletter that ran, I think, for two or three years uh, from 1984 onwards. Uh, you can see the lesbian line um, advertised in this, um, just in the bottom left. So it comes under Leeds switchboard by this point, um, which is 1985. Um, and you can see there, Tuesday is women only. Uh, so, as I said, the, um, the lesbian line itself was staffed by a small group of women. By 1983, um, it had a staff of six women and it was available for two hours on Tuesday evenings, and it received on average about six calls a night. And by 1985, as in this picture, the Leeds Lesbian Line was part of the Gay Switchboard service, and it was open from 7.30 to 9.30 every evening, but to women only on Tuesdays. According to one of our interviewees, Raymond, if a man would uh, phone up on a Tuesday, he'd get very short shrift and told to call back on a different night. Bradford also had its own LGBTQ phone lines and local people would quite often use both services to find out about societies and venues in the two cities. So Lorraine, who staffed the Bradford line once a week, describes it like this. About 1980, that was the formation of Bradford Lesbian Line, which was two women from Bradford University, plus myself, my partner and four other women. We didn't actually go live till about 1981 but it was set up through the university and had a room at Laystridge Lane and some seed money to pay for the phone. I enjoyed doing it, but we did tend to get women ringing up coming out, women who were in violent relationships, both with men and women, women who'd been raped, who we'd refer on to rape crisis, and sometimes men ringing up to get themselves off. 
We had a police whistle for that, which should blow extremely loudly and bang the phone down. So as you can tell from that account, it was really an easy job, but for the community, it was literally a lifeline. So something else that you'll see advertised on this page is friend counselling on Monday and Wednesday evenings. And this also runs from a Bradford phone line. This was specifically a befriending service, and it was set up in the 1970s by local branches of the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, which was also known by the acronym CHE. So this was a group a bit like the Gay Liberation Front, but with more of a focus on law reform, well, initially at least. Uh, you can see them represented in this photograph, which was taken in Huddersfield in 1981. And that was a, a quite an interesting year uh, for, for the North because um, the national pride event, because of course there was only really one pride event uh, that took place in, in the early 80s, took place in London. Uh, but in 1981, the whole event was moved up to Huddersfield to show solidarity with people there who were being victimised by ongoing continuous police raids on a really popular night called the Gemini. Lots of people would travel from Leeds and, and from much further afield to the Gemini and following these um, pretty constant police raids on it, um, people from London decided to show their support um, and so they moved the National Pride up to, uh, to Huddersfield in 1981. We've got some fantastic photographs um, from that event which are available on the West Yorkshire Waste Stories uh, website. This is a, a poster dedicated itself to Bradford Friend. Some people would join both Che and the GLF. Uh, some saw the GLF as a bit more radical and some joined the group as just a purely social thing. But the Friend service had a counselling remit and it had branches, as I say, in both Leeds and Bradford. One of the people we interviewed, Eric, um, said that the Leeds branch didn't last very long and the remaining staff, when it closed, moved over to Bradford. And he'd been part of the Leeds uh, section but he stayed with the service for 14 more years. He said that calling it friend was not quite a good idea. Some people thought it was the Quakers, the religious society of friends, and others would ring up saying something like, you're a friend, I'm a friend, I want another man tonight. There were also people who felt in the early days that when they phoned up, they had to put on something like a gruff voice. And at first you think, oh no, they phoned us to cause trouble, but they weren't. They had to put on a sort of macho voice rather than just say, I like men, where do I go to a pub to meet other ones like me? And I think that's a sign of the times, what it was like 40 years ago. So another group that you can see represented on this poster, but who continue to struggle for acceptance throughout the period were bisexuals. Misconceptions around bi people were and continue to be quite common. They range from the make your mind up misconception that suggests everyone's sexuality should be fixed and binary, uh, binary to the erroneous belief that HIV was originally spread from gay men to straight women and wider British society as a result via bisexual behaviour. And this is a pin badge from the 1990s, which was made by Leeds-based activist Sue Balcom, who organised Bisexual Women's Weekends in Horton and Ribblesdale in North Yorkshire. And you can hear her talking about these sorts of myths associated with bisexuality, as well as some of the other campaign materials that she created on the website. But back in 1988, biphobia seems to have been at a bit of a peak in Britain, and that's including within the queer community itself. So one of our other interviewees, Chris from Leeds, recalls that the London Gay and Lesbian Switchboard refused to allow self-identifying bisexuals onto its premises. So Chris had attended a conference in London in October of 1988, and this was called BICON, and he left with the contact details of some new friends that he met there up north. Um, as well as a determination to set up a bi group in Yorkshire, which to his knowledge will be the first one. So this eventually did come to pass uh, when four people met at White Locks Pub in 1989 and decided to put together a group. In the early years, they'd gather in a shop basement near the Corn Exchange. Chris can't remember exactly where that was, um, but they fairly quickly moved on to the Adelphi Pub uh, down at Bridge End, which became a regular meeting place for them. So the group organised discussions, parties, walks and travel to other events together. And members of the group also included the future novelist Jay Carnot, um, who you might recognise as the author of the books The Long Firm and He Kills Coppers, both of which have been televised in the last decade or so. And Chris remembers the group also advertising the Leeds or the paper, like the women's discos that we saw earlier, and being around as a group for about five or six years. 
Eventually, personality clashes led to some of the members splitting off and the main group itself disbanding. Um, he also remembers there being some differences and dis disagreements along gender lines um, amongst different members of the group. But they clearly offered a space for a misunderstood community within the community to exist. So today, a more recently formed bi group has been active in Leeds since 2014, and they've held events and marched in Leeds Pride as part of a real rainbow of present day LGBT communities and individuals. And that's roughly where I'd like to draw this talk to an end um, in time for some questions. So here's an image taken 20 years after the last one, not far from the Adelphi, showing a really busy bridge end during Leeds Pride 2019. It's packed with people standing out from the crowd, standing up for each other and celebrating freedom and diversity. In those 50 years since the Stonewall riots, through the highs of holding trailblazing events like the 1974 Trans Conference in Leeds, to the lows of getting frog marched out of your favourite pub, or slapped in the face by a stranger, it's safe to say that the risks they took have paid off for many of us today. And the risk we must take is to stand up for those whose journey to safety and acceptance is still far from complete. Thank you for listening. I'm, I'm really happy to take any questions that anybody has. I'll do my best to answer them. I've got a question. Well, it's not a question, it's a comment, really. Uh, I don't really know where to start to tell the truth, because I think in this society, there's all manner of problems with respect to uh, sexual behaviour, perceptions of sexual behaviour, and that kind of thing. And this can be even for heterosexual people. Uh, it's very difficult to talk frankly about any sexual topic. You can't use the word sex when you address somebody with a most innocuous question without seeming to form uh, to, to uh, incite great offence in them. Uh, people seem to be to seem to have a purient interest in other people's sexual attitudes or sexual behaviour, whether they view pornography, that kind of thing. So uh, I think I think the problems of the uh, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, etc. community uh, uh, are just the tip of the iceberg, really. And I, and I sympathise with them uh, greatly, to tell the truth. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, but it, uh, the problems they face are, are not unique to those communities. I think uh, uh, I don't. The list goes on, really. Uh, that, that's my comment. <laughs> Thanks for your comment, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'd, Paul, you jumped in before I had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I was eager to talk. Yes, I understand that, Paul. But I should, first of all, just thank Ross for that very interesting and comprehensive talk. And it is now open uh, <laughs> for anybody else who wishes to make a comment or, or to ask a question. There is something in chat. Uh, Lucy says, great talk and brilliant project. Did anyone mention the GLF schools group? I knew some of the kids in the late 1960s and they were brilliant and very brave. So I don't know, Ross, whether you've got a comment on that. My goodness, Lucy, thank you for that. We, we didn't come across mention of the GLF school group. That, that truly does sound like something quite trailblazing. And as you say, very brave. It, um, it continues to blow my mind, really, that um, groups exist within schools today uh, where school pupils can talk about things like sexuality or seek advice from teachers and other older students around this, this, this topic, really. So to, to hear, actually, that there was... Uh, something active as early as that is is definitely something I'd, I'd like to hear more about and something I'll try and research. So really, thank you for fucking that up. So Sarah asks, uh, sorry, I'm losing a comment now in chat. Uh, data won't have been kept, but did your research throw up any indication of whether homophobic or transphobic violence has increased or decreased in the city over this period? Again, that... I think is something that we probably could research. We The stuff that we collected for West Yorkshire Queer Stories is very anecdotal. Um, it's more sort of qualitative research. And I, we always said as part of the project, we had two years to collect all this kind of stuff. And what we really should have ideally had would be three years. That will give us an extra year to really go through what we collected. Um, so, I mean, I'm very grateful to, to events like this one tonight that allow me even a couple of years after the end of the project to start reflecting on what we collected, to start sharing it and, and putting things together. Um, 
homophobic and transphobic violence is something that comes up a lot in various stories um, throughout uh, the period that we kind of essentially covered with that project. And a lot of the stuff that we collected around the 1960s and 70s um, that uh, sort of looks at victimization actually uh, tends to err on the side of victimization from the police. So one person made what to me was quite a, a revealing comment in that at this era of 1967, when um, we sort of imagine that, um, you know, greater freedom was experienced by members of, of gay communities. Actually, in his opinion, what it, what it really did was it gave the police uh, something else to kind of arrest people for. Um, so I think in that period, certainly uh, victimization, you know, did kind of come from this angle. Violence is something that people do talk about in their stories. And it doesn't, it, although I've, I've just spoken about the fact that more support for younger people in particular is available now than perhaps 20 years ago, it's still something that you come across in the story. So I, I can't 100% say for you whether it's increased or decreased. I think in terms of transphobic violence, I suspect that that may have increased with, um, with recent years and, and higher profiles that, you know, using this phrase, the risk we take, that people are prepared to, take for themselves and their communities which can also put them at risk so i'm sorry that doesn't give you much in the way of statistics but i would imagine statistics are available and it's something that we could start to pull together from the stories that we collected so thank you for that question sarah so alan um says great presentation ross i didn't hear anything about the impact that aids had on the lgbt community during the 1980s onwards you're quite right to point that out alan thank you I, it's to be honest, it's a decision that I made. Um, it, it would make a talk of its own. We collected loads on this particular subject, including some incredible stuff that members of the group ACT UP uh, shared with us around the kinds of direct action and protests that they were active in um, around the, the late 80s and throughout throughout the 90s, really. Um, you're right, this had a, not just an impact, but a massive impact on LGBT communities. Um, in the way that they are represented, the ways they think about themselves, their own lives and deaths, it's a massive one. I think we, we, we would deserve a talk on that subject on its own. If you go to the West Yorkshire Queer Stories website, one of the ways that we organise the different stories we collected was by theme. And if you pick HIV and AIDS as a theme, you, you'll see that it's, it makes up a lot of the stories. And I hope you'll be able to find some that will that'll interest you from that one. So thank you for that, Alan. I, yeah, I, I, I think it's a very, a very important topic. And then Kevin Grady says, a fascinating talk, is Lower Brigitte the principal centre of gay venues in Leeds today, or are venues more widely spread today? And then a later question, are you going to write a book? Um, Lower Brigitte, to start with, is, yeah, I'd say definitely the principal centre of gay venues in Leeds today. There aren't many outside that area. But um, th there's kind of what you have is more of a mainstream gay scene and then a slightly more alternative queer scene, I I'd call it. So there's a venue uh, called Wharf Chambers, which is um, towards the sort of bus station side of town, um, just off the calls. And that's not really uh, around the Lower Brigade area, but that and a couple of other more alternative venues are deliberately uh, slightly off that main street. Um, you, you might notice if you've walked down Lower Brigade recently that some little um, pride flags have popped up in the flagstones, which are, which are lovely, actually. Um, and they kind of draw together that um, history that um, that little area has um, in recent decades in Leeds. Um, but they also reflect the fact that for many people, that area has become a lot more commercialised. If you sort of go out around that area, um, but obviously, it's not exclusively LGBT. You'll find all sorts of groups going out there, hen parties, all sorts of things. And uh, some people on the busier nights find that um, it's not really as reflective of the night out they would like to have as an LGBTQ person. So hopefully there are other venues a little bit more widely spread, like Wharf Chambers across the city. And with regard to books, I would love to, as, as you can tell, this the project, West Church Queer Stories, it you know, collected so much stuff. Um, and that was because it was so urgent for us to go out and get this stuff while people were happy to talk about it, while they were still around to talk about it. And really one of the things that we always had in our minds was that nobody would have you know, particular ownership 
of, of this material, the idea will be that it becomes available for anybody and everybody. And whether that's that they want to write a study or a book or a piece of research, or whether they just want to be, I guess, inspired by it. So they might write something fictional, or they could even take the words from people themselves and turn them into something new or something artistic. We always, when we collected the stories, we kind of expressed and explained the same to everybody who took part. And we made sure that they were happy and um, for their words to be used or, or at least how their words could be used. And um, but the aim of the whole thing was to get it out there. So books, anything is very welcome on the subject. So definitely. And, and then Alan M, it's more of a comment than a question, but he says it would be interesting to hear the history of the LGBTQ community and its connection with the BME and faith communities. Yes, I absolutely agree. And again, we've collected a lot of kind of the starting point for that. We um we had within the project, we had uh, certain groups that we wanted to really focus on and black people and people from other ethnicities than white were very much um, encouraged to come forward with stories. Now, I know that's a big ask and for different communities um, they may find that they have to share their stories in different ways. So one of the things we did with West Yorkshire Queer Stories and, and this was one of the great things about being based in quite an untraditional way um, as a sexual health charity and a charity that already works with a lot of marginalised groups was that we or our volunteers could go along to meetings um, of, of at-risk populations and communities like asylum seekers, uh, like black people, and talk to them about their experiences and, and ask how best to, to share their stories. So that's something that I, I hope you'd agree with. There is quite a lot of on the West Yorkshire Queer Stories website and, and faith communities as well. Um, as I say, you, you kind of need to chat to people who want to share their stories about the way they want to share it. But I, I think you'll find some quite surprising stories on there around both of those topics. So thank you. So Stuart makes a comment. I always wish I'd added my story to the Queer Stories Project. I used to run the LGBT bookshop section at Leeds Uni Bookshop. So can I ask in light of that, is, is it possible for people to add their own stories to your website or is it now closed? The West Yorkshire Queer Stories Project itself is closed, unfortunately, but I've started to notice um, different and similar projects popping up recently uh, where people are, are um, doing a similar thing to what we did. So I was really happy when I saw on social media the other day that Wharf Chambers is um, hoping to run a little project about its own history, um, which is you know something we collected aspects of in my short square stories, but it will be brilliant to find more about. And things like what Stuart is talking about there, I mean, fantastic. This, I, I can tell from just what he said there that the story that he wants to share is something that will resonate with a lot of people. So I think there are projects that are ongoing that hopefully you can contribute stuff like this too. Um, one thing that we did as part of the project was encourage people to share their stories in written format, um, which we then donated to local archives and I know that archives like the West Yorkshire Archives and Leeds Libraries are quite happy to uh, collect um, written histories personal accounts like this um, because although they they will quite often have what we think of as a fairly strict donations policy they're really keen to try and capture these sorts of more marginalized histories and um, so they will quite often uh, collect something like that so I really hope Stuart, you find a way uh, to uh, tell your story to an ongoing project and there are ones that um, exist so it would be great to get that one collected. Okay so uh, Stuart adds, I, uh, I've lost it now, um, just hang on a moment while I get back to the chat, um, he adds he thinks that there is a Leeds University student project. Yes actually that's a very good point point. Um, quite often uh, when I was working on my short Shapiro stories we would get involved with groups of students who were doing small scale or history collection. And quite often their, their findings will be added into local archives as well. So that's definitely something to look out for. And then Kevin now asks, uh, what about publishers of gay literature? Are there any in Leeds? We've had some fantastic performances by gay poets, at the Leeds Library, Chelping, Open Mick, Poetry Night. Do you know of any other opportunities for LGBTQ performers writers in Leeds. I've really missed out on, on um, the Chelping event. I'll have to make sure I get to one soon because it's great to hear that there's uh, fantastic like fantastic stuff like this going on actually. 
Um, I don't currently know of any particular opportunities for LGBTQ performers, but I do know a lot of places, such as the Leeds Playhouse, are taking a real interest in, um, in mounting production. So I think uh, the Playhouse has an upcoming performance of Hedwig and the Angry Inch, um, which is um, directed by a trans director. Um, the cast are, are all queer people. It's I think a lot of the bigger organisations are wanting to see what they can do to bring stories like this out as well. So although I can't highlight a specific one for you, and I don't know any particular publishers of gay literature, um, I do know that it's something that is on the wider remit of, of some of the bigger organisations as well as the small or self-funded projects. So it's, it's something I'm quite optimistic about at the moment. Thank you. Do we have any more questions before? Yes, I'd like to ask another question stroke point. Uh, do you not think uh, having uh, homosexual own, only pubs and venues is, is a bit of an, an, an anachronism, like uh, like there were uh, male only uh, working men's clubs, etc., in the past, and private members' clubs? Uh, do you not think if, if if there was a more integration of of, of all these various communities of uh, different sexual sexualities, it, it would be a uh, more uh, more of a, a natural thing and and you not think that the segregation into a gay only pub homosexual only pub uh, is 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 a, is a bit of a an ar artificial cause of a division in a way i agree with you 50 50 on that one. i don't think it's necessarily a cause i think it obviously yes in a, in a, a more ideal world i guess to call it definitely we wouldn't be looking at any sort of segregation we'd be looking at people that got on with each other and enjoyed going out in the same spaces but unfortunately at the moment we're just not for me anyway in that place um, and specific groups are, are quite um, vulnerable in some ways and especially if it's something like socializing or going out for hopefully a good time it's just not going to happen in certain places they will face misunderstanding perhaps even deliberate antagon antagonism um, and so I think the way I see it is sort of as an ongoing uh, process where, yes, hopefully yeah. someday we would end up in that, um, in, you know, the level of integration that you're mentioning. And that's the ideal. We just I don't think we're quite there yet. So spaces like Wharf Chambers are really important for people to be able to to exist on one level. Okay. Any last comment or question? Oh, yeah, I've just seen Karen's comment there. Anyone can go to the pubs. You don't have to be LGBTQ to go in. Quite true. Uh, OK. Well, can I just thank Ross again for that most interesting talk and the generated very interesting series of questions. Uh, somebody has already suggested that you might like to come back sometime and give us another talk about the impact of AIDS or something of that kind. But I won't ask you to commit yourself in public now. <laughs> <laughs>